Uh, the Lord is so good, isn't He? Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so very much. One of my favorite, one of my favorite hymns. Well, let's take the Word of God, please, and turn to the book of First Corinthians, please. First Corinthians, chapter number fifteen. And uh, tonight, I will try to summarize and bring together everything we've studied on Islam and try to bring it to a conclusion. And so, we will be finishing, Lord willing, we'll be finishing our study in our lesson from last week. So if you do not have a lesson sheet from last week, will you raise your hand please at this time? And a brother Bill is coming this way, he will give it to you. If you do not have the lesson sheet from last week, uh, if you'll keep your hand in the air, and he will come bring that to you. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want to begin tonight by just reading uh, a few verses to get us started. As Mr. Spurgeon would say, I always begin every message with a text in the Bible, all right? And I always try to do that. Um, but this is the basis for it all, and this is the basis for what we believe. Now, where do we find our beliefs? Where does it come from? The Word of God. And that is where we find what we believe, and we judge everything else based upon what we know to be true in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, Paul says in verse number 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. This here is where we find the gospel, the complete gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, namely, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. There are these three key aspects of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we will see tonight how this will factor in, but I want to put these things together. I hope it's a help to you. And as we enter into the lesson, let's pray together and we'll begin. Father, we come to you once again knowing that we cannot do these things without you, uh, neither do we desire to do them without you. We pray you would lead and guide. I pray that every word that's spoken would be according to your will. I pray that it would be understood and clear in clarity. And I pray that we would take these things and be able to use them uh, in our lives, for your honor and glory, be able to bring others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for your death on the cross, your resurrection, uh, these things that we know to be true. Help us to know how to share them in love. And Lord, I pray you forgive us where we have failed you in our words, our actions, or our thoughts. Help us now to be able to meditate and think on these things without distraction. And may you then help us to apply them to our lives. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, as we try to come to the end of our particular series on Islam and putting all these things together, uh, we begin last week with this lesson, Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Now we begin our study with an introduction to Islam and understanding the history behind it and where it all started and what it, where it all came from. And then we did a comparison between the Bible and the Quran. And if you don't have any of these things, uh, you can ask me for them. We have copies that I can give them freely and liberally to those who may need them. So if you don't have them, I encourage you to ask for them. Uh, we did a, a comparison between the Bible and the Quran, using verses in the Quran over against verses in Scripture, in the Word of God, 
and seeing these dramatic differences between the two, uh, I had a Muslim, as I shared with you recently, say to me, well, we believe the Bible is the Word of God just like the Quran is. And I've been trying to explain to you that that's not possible. That's logically impossible because they disagree with one another. The very most fundamental truths of the Christian faith and of the Bible are either completely void and missing in Islam or they are greatly distorted. Um, that's important to understand that some of the things may be in the Quran, but they're very distorted. Um, and therefore do not agree with one another. And so to summarize a few things we've gone over, uh, if you were to ask the question, do Christians and Muslims worship the same God, we may think in our minds, oh, it's a no-brainer. It's an easy answer. Of course they don't. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, as we deal with something like this, people can climb the philosophical ladder and try to talk about different principles of reference and referring to this thing and that thing as the same name under a false description and all these kind of things. But it's really unnecessary to deal with all those things because what we're actually dealing with is the concept of God in Christianity versus the concept of God as it is portrayed in Islam. And so what we're dealing with is the concept. And so if the concept is fundamentally different, we would have to conclude that we're not referring to the same God. We're not referring to the same God. If I were to say to you, my wife has blonde hair, okay? If I were to say that to you, you would have to say, he's gone mad, right? <laughs> Something's wrong with him. He's not referring to the woman I know to be his wife because there's just a fundamental problem there. Unless I was colorblind, which thank the Lord I'm not. And, uh, but, or if I were to say something that is about a person that's drastically false, you would have to say there's either something majorly wrong with him or he's referring to a different person but just thinks that their name is that. All right? Does that make sense? So when a person says that Allah is God, what they're actually doing is they're confusing God altogether. Even though they may call him God, even though they may uh, use that designation, they're not actually referring to the same God that we worship, that we serve because the differences are so fundamental, so diametrically opposed to one another, that they cannot be the same God. So the two concepts are fundamentally different. Uh, you would have to remove the most essential and basic characteristics from the God of the Bible to arrive at the concept of Allah in Islam. You would have to take away these basic fundamental differences. I'm glad we had the young people with us tonight because I believe this could be helpful to you too. Uh, these are things that I, I think are very basic. I'm not going in great depth. We did that a little bit with the Quran, talking about those different verses. But really these are very basic things. And in fact, I have, I have eight things uh, on this lesson that compares Islam with Christianity. And I would encourage you tonight to take these things if you ever encounter in Islam and you're led of the Lord to speak to them about the Lord, these are the things. Now believe me, these are the things that you need to know. These are the things that you can use to speak to that person about Christ. How many of you would say, in some point in my life, I have met a Muslim? Would you raise your hand? Okay, many of us, I would say more than half of us, have done that. So what does that tell us? It shows that there is a great number of Muslims in this country living all around us, and we cannot just simply avoid them altogether and say, I'm never going to speak to them. Uh, you could live your life that way, but you may be face-to-face -face with it and have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with them. Now, before I go further, uh, many times when we think about Muslims, uh, sometimes we think about the terrorist aspect, because uh, when, when the terrorist attacks happened at the turn of the century, uh, at that point, the religion of Islam burst into public eye because people began to realize the terrorist things that were involved. And the truth of the matter is that even to this day in the world, places like Nigeria, Afghanistan, so on and so forth, I get emails constantly uh, about those who are not only persecuted but are killed by Muslim extremists. Uh, and that are being killed or persecuted by Fulani Muslims and others. And the truth of the matter is, we call them extremists. 
But as we have learned, the truth of the matter is, if someone is willing to kill as a Muslim for their faith, they're really not an extremist, they're actually a fundamentalist. Because if we read the Quran, we read the things uh, that Muhammad told the people to do, it's really not extreme at all. But as I back kind of down from that, I want you to understand that the majority of Muslims, the majority of Muslims, especially that live in the United States, do not have any desire to be terrorists. Um, and many times they don't even understand kind of how that was actually required as far as you were to fight against those who fought against you and that that was a requirement uh, in the Quran. But the truth of the matter is many do not think that way. If they've come to the United States, many times they're coming a lot of times to flee um, a lot of the situations that they're dealing with. Some of them just grow up in it. So uh, the truth of the matter is I don't think we need to be afraid of them. I don't think we should be scared uh, to speak to them. Um, I have never met a Muslim that seemed to be militant or seemed in any way towards me. I, I just haven't encountered that. Um, I'm sure others have. Um, and so I believe that we can share Christianity with Muslims in a way that is um, loving and truthful uh, and sharing the Word of God with them. Let me uh, just briefly here uh, overview the few things we talked about, and we'll get to the new material tonight. Uh, I'll have you uh, say the blanks, okay? Number one, the God of Islam is not a loving God. He's not a loving God. As we have learned, the Quran repeatedly asserts that God does not love sinners or unbelievers. God does not love sinners. God does not love the proud. God does not love the boastful. God does not love the unbelievers, but is an enemy of the unbelievers. In Islam, in the Quran, if you would read the Quran, which I, I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying if you ever did, that you would see that God is not portrayed as a loving God. Number two, in Islam, God does not have a son. In Islam, God does not have a son. This is, in fact, the most fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam. Because who is the Son of God? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Without Jesus Christ, we have no Christianity. Without Christianity, we have no faith at all. And so this is one of the most basic fundamental differences. So if someone says, oh, Christianity, oh, Christians and Muslims basically believe the same thing. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's like the people who say, oh, we basically agree on everything except sin, salvation, God, and Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Well, that's all the basic things. All right? And so those things, if we disagree on those things, then really the truth of the matter is we disagree and cannot then those two concepts cannot be in harmony with one another. If Jesus is not the Son of God, our faith is vain. The very purpose of Christianity is destroyed. Do you see that? I'm sure you understand that. Without Jesus Christ, the very purpose of Christianity is destroyed. We won't turn there as we've already done it. First uh, John 1.14 uh, talks about that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was manifest in the flesh and shown unto us. John chapter 3, we're familiar with verse 16, of course. 17 through 18 says uh, there that God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And those who are condemned, they're condemned already because they've not believed in the who? The only begotten Son of God. In Islam, God does not have a Son. Now, number three in Islam... Jesus was not crucified. These are the most basic things. This is simple, isn't it? Uh, we're not dealing with some deep theological concepts or deep, deep theological things. This is not what we're dealing with at all. The most basic things. Jesus was not crucified in Islam. As I've shared with you, uh, the verse in the Quran says that the Jews did not kill Jesus, neither did they crucify Him, but it was only made to appear to be so. And that's what the Quran says. And anyone who's a true Muslim who believes that the Quran's the Word of God would believe that. Now, this is important to understand. Please understand this. That the Quran asserting that Jesus was not crucified is the most incorrect and historically inaccurate statement of the Quran. Because the Quran deals a lot of times with what this angel supposedly gave to Muhammad, saying God said this and God said that. But when it does deal in history, it's, it's errant. Because here, this is a historically inaccurate statement 
that it is an indisputable fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified around 30 A.D. And of course, the Word of God says that because the eyewitnesses wrote that. But even outside of that, all other New Testament scholars would agree that it's indisputable that Jesus Christ was crucified. So, this fundamentally disagrees with everything about Christianity. The truth of Christianity hinges on the death of Christ, of Christ and the atonement of His shed blood. I hope if you haven't done this already, you'll look at Romans 5, 6 through 11. We won't turn there now. But that talks about how we've received the atonement. The atonement. That's the expiation. That's the propitiation, the substitute, uh, the vicariousness of the death of Christ atoning for, taking the place of our sin. And that is what the crucifixion does. Now, look with me as we've, we've read, won't read it again, but 1 Corinthians 15 is the initial, the very first, it is said. Um, now, I don't, when I read the Word of God, I'm not concerned with these things, but it is said by, by scholars that this uh, initial creed of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ goes back to as close or as little as five years from the very uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is something that was handed down, and Paul says, I've delivered unto you that which I have received, that Christ died on the cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. This is not uh, historically challenged. This is truth. Of course, we know it is because it's the Word of God. Uh, the witness of the Holy Spirit tells us that this is the Word of God, and He's made that known and clear and manifest to us. However, for those who do not have the Word of God, do not have the witness of the Holy Spirit, would need to understand that this is historically proven, historically accurate, um, when it says that He was crucified on the cross. Number four, in Islam, therefore, Jesus would not have what? Risen again. Of course, if Jesus did not die by crucifixion, He certainly did not rise from the dead. Now you could say, well, He could have died another way and rose again, but in the Quran it says something to the effect of, uh, uh, for my kind of understanding of it, is that not only did the Jews not kill Him, He wasn't crucified, but He really didn't die at all. Uh, he was just taken up to be with God. Uh, again, this is a great distortion from what we know to be true about Christ. If he didn't, if he wasn't crucified, he certainly wasn't risen. And if you take these things out, you totally destroy Christianity. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. First Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read just a couple of these verses um, as we shared last week. First Corinthians 15, uh, verse number 12. <clears throat> now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men most miserable. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity. There is no faith because Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave through not just His death, but He was proclaimed to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is what authenticated everything Christ said. Someone asked me recently, well, how do we know Jesus Christ was divine? How do we know He was the Son of God? Well, we could talk about a lot of things, from the virgin birth and so on, that, that, that shows His deity, that He was not born of a man, but He was born of a virgin, and, and that shows His deity. But I would say even more than that, someone could argue and have their own ideas about it, but His resurrection from the dead is the foremost proof of His deity because only a divine being, only a divine person could rise from the dead and therefore He was proclaimed to be the Son of God with power. Now, others have been risen throughout the years, but someone else raised them. 
Christ raised people from the dead. His disciples raised people from the dead. But Christ himself rose from the dead, thereby proving that he was the Son of God with power. And this, therefore, shows the deity, the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, the resurrection of Christ, again, is historically proven. Not that we would need that, but for someone who doesn't believe it, would need to be reminded that it is, it is accurate, it is historically indisputable, that not only did Jesus die on the cross around 30 AD, but that his tomb was discovered empty. The tomb of Christ was discovered empty by his, a group of his women followers. And there's so much more we could say about that even, but I don't want to get off on that at this time but that his tomb was found empty. And, of course, we know, as Scripture says, that they made up lies about it, didn't they? They made up lies. And they said, oh, his disciples stole him away while he slept. But we know that not only did he die, he rose again, and therefore the whole movement of Christianity began at that time because he appeared to them after his resurrection. Now, these were not hallucinations. Some would would say something like that, that, oh, these were some hallucinations. But the truth of the matter is, in the eyewitness accounts, there were 500 at once that saw Christ, which is not the way a hallucination works. Um, but that 500 saw him at once. Many independent sources. Now, that's important to understand. Remember we talked about the Quran with Muhammad receiving all this in the vision, uh, in the cave, and then he continues to receive more revelations throughout his life? Well, we have independent sources. Not one man saying Christ died and was resurrected, but multiple and independent eyewitness accounts of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they saw him in the face. So, Islam completely rejects not only the crucifixion, but the resurrection of Christ. Now, let us get to these few last points, the new material tonight. In Islam, number seven, salvation must be obtained by works alone. This is in, in, in Islam. In Islam, salvation must be obtained, not Christianity, but in Islam, salvation must be obtained by works alone. Now, I use the word salvation very loosely because I really don't see any salvation at all in the Quran or in Islam. But if a person could possibly receive salvation in Islam, it would only be by works. In Islam, there is no sure hope of salvation. You must believe in God, or Allah, in His prophet Muhammad, do good works, and give alms. These are the things that you must do. Now, we don't, we don't have to believe in God and Jesus Christ and give our tithes, amen. They say, you must do this. You must give your alms. You must do good deeds. Now, this is in the Quran. The Quran actually says that you will be rewarded according to your good deeds. In other words, it will be paid to you as you paid in this life. Not the concept in Christianity that Christ paid for our sins, but you will pay as you have paid. Now, uh, if that were true, then all of us would have a very serious detriment on our hands because all of us would have to pay for our sin. But in Islam, there's no sure hope of salvation because the good deeds have to outweigh the bad deeds. If you were to ask a Muslim today, how do you know you're going to obtain paradise? They would most likely say, probably nine times out of ten, they would say the good deeds have to outweigh the bad deeds. There's actually a verse in the Quran I have shared with you where it says there's a balance and the balance must go on the good side. And so this is how a Muslim would hope to obtain salvation. And this is why they maybe do very uh, some things that we cannot even imagine hardly is because of the fact that they think this will somehow help them to obtain salvation. You know, it's kind of like Martin Luther who would climb the steps of the monastery, monastery until his knees were bleeding because he thought, somehow, somehow, I have to be able to uh, crucify myself and cause enough suffer suffering on myself and have enough good deeds that somehow I'll get to heaven until one day he saw the verse, the just shall live by faith, and realized that it was through Christ and not through his good works. But in Islam, there would be no salvation apart from good works. 
This is fundamentally different from the salvation in Christianity, because in Christianity, salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Turn with me, if you will, to... We won't turn to all these passages. I hope you will in your own time, but just for time, um, so we can look at them. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we know this reference very well, but I want us to read a little bit of the surrounding uh, passages. Or excuse me, some of the surrounding uh, verses here. In Ephesians chapter 2, notice with me, please. Now, I love John 5.24, one of the... One of them that's notated here. John 5.24 tells us that we are passed from death into life, shall not come into condemnation, because we've believed. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, look with me at verse number 4. Now, if this doesn't get a Christian excited, I have no idea what will. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us. Remember, the God of Islam is not a God of love. He loves those who love Him. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins. God loves dead people that are spiritually dead in their sin. He loved them. He's not enemies of them, but He loves them. He has quickened us, hath quickened us together with Christ. And then in parentheses, by grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, this has already taken place. We're already seated there. We're already in the heavenly places in Christ because we've already received the salvation. It's not something we're hoping to obtain, but we've already received it. We've been passed from death unto life. And therefore, we've been risen up together to sit with Him in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Now, Islam is all about yourselves, because you can only obtain it or hope to obtain it by what you do. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I could obtain my salvation through works, I would boast of that before God. Because I would say, I'm here in heaven, you're not, because of my good works. Or you would say, I'm in heaven, and you're not, because of my good works. But what does the Bible say? Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Because we have our faith is in Christ and Him alone for our salvation. Therefore, we have no means of boasting. We cannot boast of our own good works. Now, we are created, as the next verse says, to good works. We don't do that in order to obtain salvation, but because of the salvation we have. Remember that? We don't do what we do in order to, but because of. That's a great thing to remember. We do not do what we do in order to receive something or obtain something, but because of what we've already received through Christ. In Christianity, once salvation is obtained through faith in Christ, it is forever. Forever. That's a Bible word. It is forever. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3, um, we have looked at that many times. Let's on our way there, let's go to Titus, please. I want you to just see these verses and keep them in mind. Titus chapter number 3. I remember years ago, perhaps when I first really came upon it, and, and I've loved it ever since, and love what it teaches us here in Titus chapter number 3 and verse 4. Many times we see the word but as a conjunction uh, from what's previously been said, and many times it's a glorious thing. Yes, you were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, and so on. But, in verse 4, after that the kindness and love of God our Savior Toward man appeared, Titus 3, 4. After that, the kindness and love of God. Look at that again. I didn't even plan that. How many times do we see the love of God? The love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us 
by washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, do any of you understand what an heir is? An heir is someone who has it because it's in their Father's will. They, it's as if they already have it because they're an heir of it. And so we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life because we've received salvation through grace by faith in Christ and in Christ alone. Now, 1 Peter chapter number 1, please. Turn quickly over there, 1 Peter chapter 1. Just see the blessedness of this passage once again. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, there it is again. The resurrection makes all of this possible. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's been reserved by God. And so it's not, we're not going to lose the reservation who are kept by good works? No, but by the power of God. These things, this inheritance is kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's already ready. It's as if it's just waiting on us to get there. It's already ready for us. And he says in verse 9, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You know, I can tell you today, I am saved already. Not that I'll be saved when I get to heaven. No, I'm already saved. I get to go to heaven because I'm saved. Salvation is something we receive already. The end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So salvation in Islam must be obtained by works, if it could ever be obtained. But I would venture to say it really could not be, in the sense that even to the person who thinks they can, how could they ever be sure? They could not be. Because how do you know what you're going to do wrong tomorrow, the next day or the next day or the next day? But in Christianity, salvation is obtained by grace alone. And that's the only way anyone will ever obtain salvation. So there's no certainty. Okay, lastly. Number eight, they, meaning the Muslims, those who believe in the tenets of Islam, they reject the truth of the Word of God. They reject the truth of the Word of God. It's not that the Quran is the Word of God. I think we've dealt with that already. And the way it was given was not defined in Scripture. He said there's no private interpretation. This thing was not done in a corner. But instead, God gave it through His men, His penmen that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that Muhammad was not inspired that way, but claimed to have some vision, and claimed to have some truth which disagrees with the Word of God that's already been given. They reject the truth of the Word of God. Jews and Christians, now this is very important to understand. Jews and Christians in the Quran are called what? The people of the book. The people of the book. And that's really a derogatory term because they believe the Bible. The people of the book is what they're called again and again and again. And they are derided on many occasions for their belief in Christ, in Him being the Son of God, in the deity of Christ, and in His resurrection. The deity of Christ just means the Godhood, that He is one with God, He's equal with God, and His resurrection. The Quran twists and contradicts the Word of God, which was already given to man. Already given to man. So, Jews and Christians are considered the people of the book, and the Bible is universally rejected uh, in its major doctrine. It's universally uh, rejected by the Muslims because of many of these things about Christ that the Word of God claims that the Word of God gives us through these eyewitness accounts. The Word of God's been given, it's been preserved. Now remember I've said to you before, 
How long after Christ did Muhammad live? Somebody know? 600 years. Um, he was born in 570, received the first uh, revelation in 610. Uh, that's about 600 years after Christ. The word of God was already given. You say, how do we know? <laughs> you say, how do we know that the Quran's not a new revelation that's added to the word of God? Well, let's close with a few, a few passages, shall we? Um, we've already read one in, in Revelation, but please look with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Verse 17. Paul says, For we are not as many, many, not just a few, but there's many that do this. For we are not as many, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so Paul says, we're not then that corrupt the word of God. The word of God that's already been given in its fullness. The word of God's already been given. It's been canonized. It's been given and preserved as God promised through the ages. And then someone comes along. Well, anybody could do that. And many people have. Joseph Smith said, I have it. But his didn't say what Muhammad said. Others have said, popes have said, that I have the word of God. God said this. So how do we know it's wrong? How do we know it's wrong? Turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter number 1. Will you please? Galatians chapter number 1. Now, I will mention to you, one of our members, I was having a conversation with him, and he brought this verse to my attention. I said, brother, I hadn't thought about it. And this is probably one of the best verses we could possibly use uh, when it comes to Christianity and Islam and the way that the Word of God was supposedly given to Muhammad. How do we know that it's false? How do we know it's not from God? Galatians chapter number 1, notice verse 6. I marvel, Paul says, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now notice verse 8. But though we, including the apostles, but though we, or an angel from heaven, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be be accursed. Now notice that this passage does not only say if a man gives you another gospel, but he says an angel from heaven. You know what Muhammad claimed? That Gabriel spoke to him these words. Now, I, I completely reject that. I don't believe it's true. But let's just say it was true. And you could say this to a Muslim. Let's say it was true that Gabriel actually came from heaven and gave Muhammad the Quran. It still does not mean it was right. If it disagrees with the gospel of Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Doesn't matter if it's an angel from heaven. And so many of these religions, they come about that way because an angel from heaven supposedly gave it to them. It almost seems like God knew about it beforehand, doesn't it? Amen. That he knew that it would happen this way. And he said, watch out. Don't listen to a man or even an angel that would come and say, this is the true word of God, when it's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when we deal with Islam, it's not hard to see that is fundamentally opposed to the truth of the Word of God. 
When you deal with something like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, which we will deal with that, Lord willing, that's a little harder to deal with. It's, it's a little more intricate when you're dealing with doctrines of Christ and so on. But this right here is obviously, you cannot miss it, obviously a perversion, obviously not even just a perversion, but another gospel, a totally different gospel. You know, here's what happened. Muhammad said, okay, yeah, the word of God says this, but now God came to me and gave me a new gospel and said, this is what you have to believe. This is what you have to do to be saved. The Bible clearly promised, clearly warned, clearly gave this warning that people would come, men would lead people away by saying, this is truly the word of God. Saying, angels told me this. So we find from this that Christians and Muslims do not worship the same God. The Muslims, unfortunately, worship a deficient, a defective, and an inferior God, which is not the God of the Bible. We should lovingly share with Muslims the God of the Bible, and especially His Son, Jesus Christ. And then we pray that they will receive His love and accept Christ in their heart and life. And so I do not recommend to you that you come to a Muslim and start tearing up the Quran and saying this is wrong and this is wrong. No. We share Jesus Christ with them. We share these things about Christ. God is a loving God. God has a Son whom He gave for the sins of the world. Jesus was crucified. He rose again, thereby making way for our salvation. Salvation is obtained by grace through faith in Christ in Christ alone. We have the Word of God which has already been given. And then we can say, this Quran is not the Word of God. It disagrees with what God has already given us in the Bible about God, about Jesus Christ. And then as in closing, turn with me as we close tonight to Revelation chapter 22. We've read this before and we will close with this. This is the warning given to all mankind. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, For I testify, John writes, unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. This is the warning God gives, that this is the end. God has closed the revelation. He's closed it up. He does not give new revelation. Now God can give illumination through His Holy Spirit, giving us knowledge through His Word, helping us to understand things we did not previously understand. But it is always what the Word of God says. If anyone says, God told me this, it's contrary to the Word of God, it is false. It is wrong. And these are things we can share in love. I've had good conversations with Muslims um, where we were kind to one another, but I shared him the truth. And when he walked away, he said, I'll think, basically. I'll, you know, I'll think about it. And so this is what we're trying to do, to share the love of God with people who very tragically uh, have been deceived. Now, this is my last lesson on Islam. Uh, so do we have any questions? Brother James. I think the Spirit is alluded to in the Quran, but it's a totally different concept than what we would have. They do not say that believers, that the Holy Spirit indwells believers or anything like that. Uh, so it's basically missing. Um, I, I would say from what I have seen and studied, that maybe the Spirit's mentioned, but it is not a personal Spirit. And here's the reason why, okay? Now, this is very important. They do not believe in a trinity. They do not believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe that God living in us is through His Holy Spirit. That's the triune God. They believe in a Unitarian God. We believe in a triune God. They say God is one person. We say God is three persons. Not a, we're not polytheistic, but we believe God is three persons persons. So His Holy Spirit living in us would then mean that's God living in us, speaking to us, but in Islam it's, it's missing, 
It's not there. Um, the Spirit may be alluded to, but I'm not even sure about that, uh, that it's alluded to at all. And it certainly would not have the meaning that we have. Does that help? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Anyone at all? Okay. Anyone at all? It's a great, great, great question. Okay. All right. Very good. As the Lord leads, I want to continue working on dealing with a few other religions that I think will help you. Uh, it's all around us, but we can share the love of Christ with them. Uh, let's close in prayer, shall we?